on what we call Father's Day. And I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Amen. I see my, my nephew in the house, and he's a great father and a great man of God. Uh, also, my, my sisters, my sisters in the house, all of them here. Amen. And I just want to say thank you uh, for all coming out to, today. I know y'all coming to support Dad for Father's Day, but it's still, <laughs> still good to see you out there, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I had read for your hearing, Matthew, starting out Matthew verse 25. We're going to start with verse number one. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it was just read. <clears throat> I'll do Matthew verse 25, uh, chapter 25, verse number one, and verse number 10. Amen. Amen. Scriptures reads, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. I chose for a topic today, Are You Ready? For the bridegroom. Amen. To discuss this topic, I'll make three really quick points and a lesson will be yours. The greatest bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The greatest bride, the church. And the day of holy matrimony. When we think of a marriage, what do we think about, y'all? We think about what rings and nice hairdos, nice wedding dresses, tuxedos, all these kind of things. Usually the bride's concerned about getting her bridesmaids together, her bridesmaids together, and getting her hair done, getting her nails done, making sure she look good for the event. The groom, he's concerned about making sure his best man has a DJ and all the other things he has to take care of for the great wedding. The parents of the event also pitch in. They usually help with the planning of the, of the great event. They usually pitch in financially as well. Well, uh, and everything, comes together to make a good wedding. And although everybody plays a part in a wedding, the ultimate success of the wedding will depend on the bride and the groom. Mm -hmm. Well, the Church of Christ is the bride and all us saints, and Christ is the groom. Amen. Truly a match made in heaven. Like with most families, like I said, the parents kind of help out, help with the planning of the event, usually generally months before the event. God took it even a step further. Even before the earth was formed, he prepared a marriage for his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Therein lies the great groom we call Jesus, because he's coming back for his bride, which is the church. And since we are the church, the bride, I have to ask one simple question. Are you ready for the return of your bridegroom? Now, Jesus, we know, is the greatest groom that ever lived. There's no doubt about that. No man in the history of the world has had an impact greater than Jesus did. That Jesus was better than all the kings that ever reigned. Amen. All the armies that ever marched. All the presidents that ever reigned here in America. Because all their reigns were temporal. They're all just human beings, so they only be, they are temporal themselves. But Jesus' reign is forever and ever. And some of the things that makes Jesus such a great groom for us, the church... Is his character, his power, his work, and the love for his church. Now, as we look at our own lives, it's very difficult to imagine someone can live here on earth without sinning. Because uh, most of us, each and every day, we do something that's sinful. But Hebrews 4.15 says, He was tempted like we are, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show you that you can <coughs> not sin if you choose to follow Christ. Because Christ is our example for righteous living. Amen. Some, of us, some of us today can get upset. Somebody just cut us off. We'll cuss them out like a dog. Amen. But Jesus said he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. I know you see rose rage incidents all the time because somebody has gotten upset too bad. Too, and their character has caused them to erupt on somebody. All over something very small, like cutting them off. People have even got killed for getting cutting somebody off in traffic. We live in a world of such chaos. Think about what happened in Orlando this last week. We live in a world of violence and chaos, and so did Jesus. First Peter 22 and 24 says, Who did not sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, who's reviled, yet reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, 
So the Bible says that there was no sin and no gal, meaning no matter what went on in Jesus' life, he still remained the same. He remained faithful to his Lord and his Savior, God. Well, many of us, we have that same opportunity in each and every day. But what do we do? A lot of us, we'll go off on somebody real quick. But we got to remember, we can't retaliate when somebody. It's not about what people do to you. It's how you respond to how they, what they do to you. The Bible says in, in Hebrews 5 and 8, that though he, though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. See, some of us don't want to learn by the things that we go through. We want to just attack and retaliate. But you got to learn from those experiences as Jesus did. But this will make him such a perfect groom because he didn't retaliate. He was a man that thought about everything he did before he did it. Amen. And he always was concerned about the will of his father, not his own will. Right. Luke 22 and 42 says, Father, if thou be willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will, be done. Mm -hmm. See, the key is, no matter what, what, he, what he wanted to do, the Lord's will always has to be done. Amen. See, the, Christ is not going to force you to follow him and do what he tells you to do. It's up to you. It's like no one's going to force you to marry them in this life. But just like Christ is going to be our spiritual husband, he's not going to force you to be that bride. It's up to you to want to be that bride. But Jesus loves you more than you'll ever love him. Because in Romans 5 and 8 says what? But God command, commanded his love but toward us. But God commanded his love toward us. In that. In that. While we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners. Christ died for Christ us. Christ died. For us. For us. So Jesus wants to marry you. Yes, you. He wants to put you, make you his holy bride one day. But he only want to do that for those that are obedient to him. Philippians 2 and 8 says what? And being found in fashion. And being found in fashion. As a man. As a man. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. And became obedient. And became what? Obedient. Obedient. Unto death. Unto death. Even to death. Even to the death of the cross. cross. Now I know some of y'all might have spouses that you don't love all the time. They don't even deserve your love sometimes. <laughs> Well, we definitely don't deserve the love of Christ, but he still gives us to us. That's how great Christ is. Each and every day, he demonstrates all his love for us. That's what makes him the greatest spouse that we've ever seen. Now, the power that Jesus had was unique in the fact that he was God and he was a man. Amen. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This text lets you know that Jesus is not only the Word, but He is also God that's been here since the beginning of time. Amen. And what makes Him even more unique is He was God that lived here amongst us. John 1 and 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and became of the Holy Begotten Father, full of grace and truth. So verse 1 proves that Jesus is the Word, but the next verse proves that he was a man just like you and me. Amen. But unlike you and me, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Mm -hmm. Now, with him making that claim at that time, the Jews thought he was blasphemous. Like, man, how can you say you're the son of God? You, you came, then you come from Mary. You, we know Joseph. We know your parents. So how are you going to make this great claim? But Jesus said in John 8, 58, before Abraham born, was born, I am. This theory proved that the power of Jesus was shocking because people at that time regarded Abraham as their father. Yeah, he said, I came before Abraham came. So he let you know that nothing is more important than him. Although y'all have a great reverence for Abraham, Abraham is nothing compared to Christ. Yeah, John 1 and 3 says what? All things were made by him. All things were made by him. And without him. And without him. Was not anything made. Was not anything made. made. That was made. That was made. Think about the stars, the storm, the moon, the stars. Everything in this world was made by him. Jesus had the power to calm storms. He had the power to heal the sick, to wake the dead. He had all this great power. And when he came back, he said, all power has been given unto me in the heaven and earth. 
In Matthew 28 and 18, he says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. So no other spouse in the history of the world has had such power. No other man has a more important mission. No other person had a more important work than Jesus. You can think of the greatest, the biggest CEO in the world. Think of the richest ones in the world. But none of them had the same responsibility that Jesus did. See, Jesus came to save the sin-sick world. Amen. He came to sacrifice for all the people in the world. And to establish mankind, that's kind of hard to fathom. But he came to reconcile you back to the Creator. Because Jesus is your mediator. Now Jesus wishes that everyone comes to him and no one rejects him. Because if you reject Jesus, you reject salvation. Amen. And no one else can give you access to God. And he's your only, only mediator. Now his death brought life to us. Giving us the next necessary reconciliation for our sins. Romans 5 and 10 says what? Give me Romans 5 and 10. For if, for if, when we were enemies, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, we were reconciled to God, by the death of his son, by the death of his son, much more, much more, being reconciled, being reconciled, we shall be saved, we shall be saved, by his life, by his life. What love that God has shown us to bring this sinful man back to God by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I've shown you the perfect husband. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the perfect bride, the church. Now Jesus displayed his character, his power, his work, and his church. In Matthew 16 and 18, he said, oh, give me Matthew 16 and 18. But in Matthew 16 and 18, he's promising that he's gonna start something that only he's gonna be able to do and it's going to be something that lasts forever and ever. And I say unto thee. And I say unto thee. Thou art Peter. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock. And upon this rock. I will build my church. I will build my churches. No, church. I will build the many churches as I heard today. My church. The Bible says I will build my singular, solitary, uno, one church. And the gates of hell and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Shall not prepare, be what not prevail against it. Now he promised that he would build one church and he's gonna die for that one church. Amen. He didn't say he's gonna build multiple churches, Amen. multiple spiritual bodies. He said he's gonna build one church. Mm -hmm. He said I'm one bed, one one father, one head, one body, one church. Let's get to, get for me Ephesians five and twenty four. Uh, therefore, therefore, as the church is subject, as the church is subject unto, unto Christ, Christ mm -hmm. so let the wives, so let the wives be to their own be husbands, be to their own husbands in everything, in some things, everything, in everything. See, verse twenty-four is letting you know that the bride, which is the church, must be obedient to her husband in everything. Go down twenty-five. Husbands, it said husbands. Love your wife. Love your wife. Even as Christ. Even as Christ. Also loved the also church. Also loved the church. And gave himself. And gave himself. For it. For them. It. The Bible says that even also that Christ loved, he gave himself for what? For it. Showing you again that it's just one. Amen. He didn't give himself for many. He gave himself for one. Verse 25, let Christians know that we must love the church and do everything we can for the church. Just like a husband will do anything to prove his love to his wife, we must do everything to prove our love to God. Go down to number 26. That he might, that he might sanctify, sanctify and, cleanse it and cleanse it with the washing, with the washing of, water of water by the word. By what? By the word. See, verse 26 is letting you know that the washing of the word is baptism. Mm -hmm. Through the blood and through the immersion of baptism, Amen. that's how you gain salvation. Go ahead and drop down to 27. That he might, that he might present, it present it to himself, to himself a, glorious church, a glorious church, not having spot, not having spot or, wrinkle, or wrinkle, or any such thing, or any such thing, 
but that it but that it should be holy that be holy and without blemish and without blemish it said again there it goes again it shall be holy and without blemish mm -hmm. since letting you know that the church mm -hmm. is perfect and it must be when jesus come back for it it must be ready for the bridegroom if we look at the human side of the church, we might only see the hypocrisy, the frailties of men. But if we look at the head of the church, we see the greatness and the fullness of the body. That's why not, let no man get you out the church. If you get into it with somebody at the church, don't let them make you lose your soul. Because remember, we answer to God and not man. Amen. Now the church is great because it's the only bride of Christ. But it's also great because it's his body and he is the head of it. The Lord's church is unique and original in the fact of that you can't join it. You can't join, you can join the congregation, but you can't join the church. Right. Acts 2.47 says what? Somebody give it for me. Acts 2.47. Praise God. Praise God. And having favor with all the people. And having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added, and the Lord added, added to the church, to the church daily, daily, such as should be saved, such as should be saved. Since He built the church, only He can add to the church. All those saved are only found in the church. The church is great not because of the individual members are perfect, but it's great because Christ is perfect. Some people may leave to seek another spouse. But you better not leave your bridegroom, Christ, because he is our mediator. He's our sacrifice for sins. He's our high priest. He's our advocate and counselor, our pathfinder, our help and our strength. First Timothy 2 and 5 through 6 says what? For there is one God. For there is one God. And one mediator. And one mediator. Between God. Between God. And men. And men. The man. The man. Christ Jesus. The man. Christ Jesus. Go on to read number six. Who gave himself. Who gave himself. A ransom for a all. A ransom for all. To be testified. To be testified. In due time. In due time. So there's going to come a time mm -hmm. to where he's going to testify on everything he's talked about. We look at Colossians 1 and 21 and let's know that uh, when we sin, it separates us from God. So that's the necessary, 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 necessity for Jesus to be there because he's the one who could talk to God and let him know that, hey, we really just didn't mean that. And the word mediate means to interpose between enemies, to harmonize or to reconcile them. Did y'all know y'all were an enemy to God in sin? But that's why we needed Christ because Christ helps us with that reconciliation to get us back to God. Amen. Now we have the perfect bridegroom, but for some of us, that's just not good enough. Isaiah 53 and 6 says, All we are like sheep have gone astray. Have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We have turned everyone into his, his own way. way. And the Lord, and the Lord has laid on him, and has laid on him the iniquity, the iniquities of us all. Of us all. Doesn't that describe us today? Because right. all of us is falling short of the glory of God. But a sinful man can't intercede for himself. Mm -hmm. He needs that perfect, unblemished Savior to step in. Amen. Who would be better to talk to God for you other than Jesus? He's up there with him already. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God set forth as appropriation through faith in his blood. That means that God, even in our sins, already created a way for us to get out of that. But it's up to us to follow that plan to get out. Right. See, Jesus paid the price for your eternal salvation. The atonement was necessary, and Jesus offered himself because no other atonement would be better than himself. Now, as a high priest, if you know something about the Jews back in those times, a high priest would offer a sacrifice for the people to have their sins rolled forward. Well, Jesus, being our high priest, committed the ultimate sacrifice by sacrificing himself, making him not only our mediator, but our high priest. But a high priest willing to give his own blood. Because most people will sacrifice the best of the best, the best animal, the unblemished animal they could find. 
But what's more unblemished than this man called Christ? He is the one that does this same sacrifice for us today. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10 and 19 says what? Having therefore, brethren. Having therefore, brethren. Boldness to enter. Boldness to enter. Into the holiest. Into the holiest. By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. By a new. By a new. And living way. And living way. Which he has con consecrated. Once he has consecrated for us. us through the evil. Through the vile. Through the veil. Veil that is. That is to his say flesh. his flesh. So his sacrifice was the one that's going to bring us back to Christ. Now his mediation as a, as a high priest gives us what? Gives us assurance of faith before God. Having Jesus to wash away all our sins. And he's also our advocate and our counselor. As I said earlier, we are separated from sin, separated from God by our sin. But John 14 and 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus didn't say I'm one of, uh, one of the many ways, or you can go many ways to get there. He said, you got to come through me to get to God. Because a lot of people are God-only people. They only believe in God. But those people will not be saved because Jesus said, you must be with him to get to God. Amen. Now, if you think about the greatest lawyer in the world, we think of maybe Johnny Cochran or somebody like that. But who would you rather have, a man advocating for you or Jesus himself advocating for you to God? Amen. That's what we have with Jesus, the best advocate, the best defender, the best man for the job. Well, we know because Jesus knows our trials. For he was tried. He knows our pain and suffering because he was tortured. He knows our temptations because he was tempted. Yeah. Being that Jesus, Jesus knew all these things, he has a certain empathy for us. An empathy and a sympathy that allowed him to come down to this world and sacrifice himself for us all. Imagine leaving the riches of heaven to come down and deal with all the filth we have to deal with. Yeah, man. And the pain and torture that he had to go through to do all this stuff. But he did it because he loves you and me. Now Christ is also our pathfinder in that he is the author of our faith. Right. Give for me Hebrews 12 uh, verses 2 and 3. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. The author and, the, and finisher the, of our faith. The author. So he's the creator. And he's the alpha and the omega. So he's the starting and he's the finisher of our faith. Who died for the who for the joy that was set. For the joy that was set. Before him. Before him. Endured the cross. Endured. He endured the agony and the pain and humiliation of the cross. For you and for me. Despising the shame. Despising the shame. And is set down. And is set down at the right hand. At the right hand of the throne of God. At the throne of God. Jesus literally provided the roadmap for righteous living. Yeah. If we follow the path of Jesus, we'll live a righteous life. Now, of course, we can't. We not be sinless because all of us are already sinned. So we ain't gonna be like Jesus in the fact that we're sinless. We've already sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. But you can be perfect in the spirit with Jesus. 1 Peter 2 and 21 says, For uh, it, even here unto you, for even unto to you, called, you were called, because Christ, because Christ also suffered, also for, suffered us, for us, leaving us, leaving us what? An example, an example, that ye should follow his steps. That we should follow in Christ's steps. Now we are led by the Spirit and follow his words. We too can live a life that's pleasing to God. We're not going to be perfect like Jesus, but we can live a life that will get us, gain us that crown that we all want to get. Amen. That's the reason why we are here today. Right. Now, that's why some people don't accept our bridegroom, though, because imperfect people have caused them to lose sight on the perfect master. Christ already did the heavy lifting for you. All you have to do is follow in his steps because he is our help. And he is our strength. See, when men and women get married, they make a vow to be together always and forever. 
With man, that is not always true. But with the bridegroom, he is always with us. Men and women can be married multiple times. Men and women can get divorced. Christ cannot do any of these things. He is tied to his bride, the church, forever and ever. Amen. Matthew 28 and 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded unto you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So even in death or in life, Christ is always with us if you belong to him. Now, while we all must have good intentions here, we might fail you. Christ won't fail you. Hebrews 13 and 5 says what? Let your conversation be. Let your conversation be. Without covetousness. Without covetousness. And be content. And be content. With such things. With such things. As ye have. As ye have. For he has said. For he has said. I will never leave thee. I will never leave thee. Nor forsake thee. Nor forsake thee. And so God has promised that he'll always be there. Unlike man, we can't make those promises. We can have the best intentions in the world, but something might come up. Something might happen along the way. But with Christ, he's always ready to receive us if we submit to the will of God. Amen. Now we know, I just mentioned, the greatness of his character. We know his power. We know his works. We know the beautiful bride, his church. Now, he has also made a sacrifice for our sins. He's been our high priest. He's been our advocate. He's been our counselor, our pathfinder, our help, and our strength. And for those in the body, he is our everything, yeah. our husband, our best friend, our Lord, our Savior. He's coming back for the bride, the church. Are you his bride? Are you part of the church that he's coming back for? See, every marriage has a what? A who, a what, a when? A where, why, and a how. Well, who is Jesus Christ? What is his spiritual body? When, now, and forever? Where the church of Christ? Why salvation in heaven? How? Through baptism. Get to me in Colossians 1 and 18. I'm closing, y'all. I'm almost done. I'm usually going to hold y'all too long. I'm almost done here. <laughs> yes, go ahead. You go ahead. And he is the head of the body. And he is the head of the body. The church. The church. Who is who, the beginning. Who is the beginning. The firstborn. The firstborn. From the dead. From the dead. That in all that things, in all things he, might he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether these things be in heaven or on earth. See, some will say, well, Christ is just a prophet. You won't make it to heaven. Hmm. Others may say, well, he was just a man. You surely won't make it to heaven. You must believe that he is the Son of God. That he died, was buried, and resurrected just for you. So it doesn't matter how many churches or how many brides the world makes, Christ only has one bride and one church that he's coming back for. Amen. God has got one set of kids he's coming back for. Those are the ones that belong to his son, Christ. So if you're not in a church, the only church that you can find in the Bible, the only bride that Christ will come back for, mm -hmm. you need to come by hearing the word, the good news that Jesus, the God from heaven, came here on earth, was resurrected, and died and was resurrected three days later with all power back in his hands. Romans 10 and 17, so, so then faith come about hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now you heard as I tell you that Jesus is the son of the living God and he came for you and for my redemption. He was humiliated, beaten and tortured so that you might have a chance of salvation. Now you can believe a lot of things but only the gospel will save you. Paul 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believe it, to the Greek first, for the, sorry, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So no one else or nothing else could save you. You must believe in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's the gospel. It's just that simple, y'all. Then you must confess him before men. Matthew 10 and 32 says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, 
him also will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. That means at your job, at your home, everywhere you go, you must confess him before men. Then Acts 3 and 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Don't think that baptized means you don't need to change. In fact, it means uh, you do need to change. If you don't change after you're baptized, the only thing you did was get wet. Amen. True baptisms come with a true lifestyle change. That's why the Bible says you can't join the church. You have to be added to the church because God knows you or what you're doing behind all closed doors. You may hide something from your spouse, but you're not going to hide nothing from the spouse, which is in heaven. See, baptism is the last step of getting into the body of Christ. Some may tell you, well, you can believe in your heart and be saved. That goes against all the teachings of the Bible because the devil believed and trembled. So simply believing makes you no better than the devil. But if you really want to get into Christ, you got to put him on in baptism. Amen. Acts 2 and 38. Give me Acts 2 and 38. Yeah, a lot of people may tell you. I heard Joe Longstein say that the other day. You believe in your heart and you will be saved. That goes against the Bible's biblical teaching, y'all. Yeah, go ahead. Then Peter said unto them, then Peter said unto them repent, and be baptized, repent and be baptized, every one of you, every one of you in, the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of, sins, the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of, sin, of, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Ghost is not residing in you if you haven't taken on Christ in baptism. Well, you might have been going your whole life without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But you need that Holy Spirit guidance because it's going to help you make the right decisions in your spiritual life. Once you've done all these things you've heard, you've repented, you confessed, you came and you got baptized, you must remain faithful until death. Get for me Revelations 2 and 10. Fear none of, the, none of those things. Fear none of those things. Which thou shalt suffer. Which thou shalt suffer. Behold. Behold. The devil shall cast some of you into, into prison. The devil shall cast some of you into prison. That you may be tried. That you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation. And you shall have tribulation ten, ten days. days. Be thou faithful. But no matter what. What do you say? Be thou faithful. Faithful unto death. And I will do what? Give thee a crown of life. Don't we all want that crown of life? Yes. Don't we want that matching robe and crown? Yes. Well, if you fear God and keep his commandments, you can get that matching robe and crown. Following the Bible will lead to your salvation. Following man will lead to your damnation. Amen. But if you are already a member of the Church of Christ and you haven't truly repented, you know you've been doing whatever you want to do, you haven't been living according to the, the way of God, you must change your lifestyle because that's the only way you'll be saved. A lot of people think, I think, when they get in a church, that, that's it. They don't have to do anything else. But we are not judged just by being in the church. We're judged by each and every day on how we live. Matthew 25 and 41 says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, God didn't even make heaven, I mean, he didn't even make hell for you. He made hell for the devil and his angels. Amen. But you can still go if you're living like the devil and his angels. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And see, God has two places he can put you, either in heaven or in hell. So it's going to be dependent on how you live here on earth. The Bible says when a man sleepeth, he cannot work. So when you, once you die, that's it. Wherever you are at that particular moment, that's where you're going to be going, either heaven or hell. And by a show of hands, how many people know the exact day they're going to die in here? I didn't think I got no takers on that. <laughs> because no one knows the day or the hour when God comes back. And since we don't know when he's coming back, today is the day you need to prepare yourself. If you will leave here today and die, you just don't know. If, we all, if any of us knew when we was going to die, we'd probably get that, that week before that. We'll get all right and get all angelic. Amen. <laughs> I know we would. I know I would. <laughs> but when God comes back, 
Let's get, get for me. Go back to our text. I'm, I'm, I'm closing, y'all. Go back for 25 and go to Matthew 25 and 10. And while they went, and while they went to buy, to buy the bridegroom came. The bridegroom came, and they were that were ready, and they that were ready went in with him, went in with him to the marriage, to the marriage. And the door, and the door was shut. Those that are with Christ or in Christ will meet him in the air when he comes back for the holy day of matrimony. Those that are not with Christ will not do that, and they're gonna go a whole different place. But those that are with Christ will meet him in the sky with the angels. Are you going to be one of those people that meet him in the sky? Well, you know by the way that you live. I don't know. Brother Gray can't watch it 24-7. Remember, God does. So if you're right with God, if you're not right with God, I need you to come right now as we sing the Savior's invitation. Yeah.